Florida. So this week I had uh, Pastor Tim asked me to open service. And I had two scriptures that were on my heart this week to share with everybody. Uh, the first one is in Acts 2 22. It says, Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. And then in Psalm 147, verse 4, it says, He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. And I feel that this week that there are many people that are looking for a miracle. Some, it may be small, and some of it may be something large and you think that God's not big enough to take care of it. But in those scriptures, it shows that God is willing to take care of all of them for us. There's not anything too big that we can ask, and there's nothing too small to take to him either. Amen. We need, we need to realize that he is capable, and we need to stop putting limitations on what we think he can and will do for us. So, if everybody could stand up, get ready to worship here, just ask that, uh, Lord, may your presence be felt by everyone here today. Let your healing hand touch everyone. Somebody here is looking for healing in their bodies. There may be somebody here that's looking for healing in their marriages, restoration of their families. We may not know what they're looking for, but you do. You know what they need. You know when they need it. We just ask that you, your presence be felt by everyone here as we begin our worship this morning. Let our worship be pleasing to you. Let it reach you in heaven. We, have, we pray all of this in your Son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. We've got some special uh, worshipers with us this morning that have come up here. These kids, these kids work really hard and to learn these songs and, and come up here and dance for us. And this is this is part of their style of worship in the back, is they love to worship. Uh, not only with their hearts, but actually with their whole body. And that's what they're going to do here this morning. They're going to dance um, to a song that we're doing called Holding Nothing Back. And so um, we're so thankful. And I think that we can learn something from these guys, don't you think? Because yeah. sometimes us, when we get older, we gotta, we're stiff. Or we don't want to move. And we kind of look at the wounds and we put our hands right here. And it's like we're glued to the seat. But you know what? When you can get free in Jesus, get free in Christ, watch these kids because they have childlike faith. And that's what I want to have is childlike faith when I worship God. Amen? Amen.
It's good to be back with you guys this morning. Great job. It's good to be back with you guys this morning. I uh, just got back from Florida here not too long ago. We were gone for um, three Sundays, I believe we missed, but it's funny because um, my wife and I we went over to, she said, man, let's go to Cocoa Beach in Daytona side, we're in the Orlando area. And I said, okay, we'll try those beaches, so let's go over there and try that. So we went over there and I, I saw the beach and I said, man, we, we gotta go to a real beach. I said, we're gonna drive over to the golf side on the other side. So we drove two hours over to the other side. And she went, wow, I know what you're talking about now. But as we're walking out on the beach, um, all of a sudden, you know, we, the beach is huge. There's tons, I mean, it takes forever to get out to the, the ocean walking on the sand there. You know, we're walking and all of a sudden we hear, Pat, Tara? And we look down and Rosie and Dar are standing, or sitting in the lane getting a, uh, a suntan. And so I thought, what a small world. So we're talking, so then Dar and I are going to go out in the ocean and we're hanging out. And he's talking to me and telling me how he dislocated his shoulder and he's just been hurting, it's been kind of hurting him lately. And then right when he says that, this huge wave just comes over and knocks him right down into the water. It felt so bad, and he's laying there, and, and then the waves are just pounding on him, and pounding, and he's rolling, and he's trying to get up. So I come over there, I there, and I grab his arm, and I, I pull him up. And when that happened, I thought to myself, you know, isn't that just like life? We'll throw these waves at us all the time. But we have a mighty God that is ready to pick us up. And then he is here this morning, ready to pick you up. So let's press through as we worship. Let's connect with him and allow him to do that for us. Let's allow him just to connect and, and uh, lift us up.
He offered us His grace. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquers the grave. says you you lay down your life God for us Lord we thank you for that you bore our cross God we should have been on that cross it's our sin God that you paid the penalty for and we're so for, so forever grateful God we thank you for the blood that washes and cleanses us of all unrighteousness God not only do you do you cleanse us and you wash us God but you forget it God those of us that come in here with a past, we all have a past, God. We thank you that that past is no more, God, that it's a clean slate. Today is a new day. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for your body that was broken on that cross, Lord, that brings healing to us, God. In Jesus' name. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky.
Thank you, Lord. Uh, while everybody's standing, turn to, turn to somebody next to you and say that you're glad to see him here this morning. Uh, we do have a special guest speaker this morning. He is the founder of the ISOM program at the International School of Ministry, which I believe there's, for us here, it's known as Leaders for Christ. Uh, we've had six or seven classes, I believe, go through the program. Uh, I am part of the last group as it's currently set up. Uh, we will be rolling out Leaders for Christ again in the fall. Uh, the program's going to be updated a little bit for anybody who is interested. Uh, so he has done many great things for the Kingdom of God, and he is also a University of Michigan graduate. So, so happy, but uh, I would like to welcome, I have the great pleasure and honor of welcoming Dr. Baron Gilfillan. Praise the Lord, all the University of Michigan people clap. <laughs> um, it's actually my, uh, my brother-in-law's family. Uh, Michigan State people. And, uh, it was some interesting family uh, gatherings. Uh, and, uh, my... <laughs> I'm saying some of the on the lighting board is, uh, is uh, obviously a Michigan State fan. <laughs> I actually grew up in uh, in South Africa and uh, went. Uh, I, I came over to the University of Michigan and met my wife there. She's from St. Clay Shores. And uh, anyway, I went through my first winter. Now, I just want to know, I just want to let you know that if you go out there and you see the nice weather outside, we born from California, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Africa. No. <laughs> but uh, I, my first winter was the most brutal thing. I mean, I, I grew up in Africa, all right? And the Michigan winter in Africa, they don't they don't have anything in common, okay? And I remember my first February, uh, I never saw the sun, not one time in the whole month of February. And I was I was looking for, for the sun, all right? And uh, anyway, um, it, it just really was a it was a culture shock. It was a weather shock. Um, and uh, so I want to uh, just welcome as well my daughter Christina. <coughs> who uh, was, was actually born in Germany, and she, uh, she was here because she was awarded two nights ago. Um, it was a Rising Star Award. It's a United Nations affiliated group at the Gerald Ford Library in, in Grand Rapids. Um, she's in her last year. In a month, just over a month, she will graduate from Temple University in law school. She'll be a full-blown lawyer, eight years in college. And, uh, she uh, was awarded. She's done a lot of tremendous work in the area of human trafficking and social trafficking, and uh, she was recognized for that. And because of that, I was going to be in Michigan. And uh, um, Paul Pastor who's really, uh, you know, we've done missions work together. Obviously, the church has run the Leaders of Christ uh, Bible School, which we created and developed most of the video content of that. And um, so we just had a tremendous partnership. We did a missions trip to Costa Rica together and uh, very much connected. Christina was a part of that trip. Um, anyway, to, to, to bring it back full circle, she's had the last few years in, uh, on the East Coast and she was in Washington, D.C. this winter, which has been, uh, she wanted to move to Washington, D.C. until this winter. <laughs> And it's been like, I don't know, the, the winter from hell. I don't know, you know, it's, uh, and I know it's affected you guys as well. We want to welcome you all to come to California because <laughs> we, uh, it's just incredible how, how God has gifted that state with good weather. So um, anyway, all that to say, it's a blessing to be here and it's good to have good weather outside and uh, hopefully that just lifts your spirits and, and hopefully the word of God will lift your spirits as well. Um, my wife and I head up the International School of Ministry, what it's known mostly around the world, the ISOM. It's the world's largest video Bible school. Uh, my background is in television and media. 
Um, I used to be the television producer for Reinhard Bonke. I traveled the world filming these massive crusades. I literally have watched millions of people give their hearts to Christ. I have uh, documented blind eyes getting open, crippled people getting healed. Um, I, I, I have filmed people born deaf and dumb over 40 years of age, uh, speaking and, and hearing, um, and interviewed the doctors, and literally some of the things I've seen, very few human beings have seen. And I'm uh, very grateful for what God enabled me to, to experience and to, to, to be able to witness and document. But at the same time in my heart, I was saying, God, what's going to happen to this millions of people? What's going to happen to them after the crusade moves on? Who's going to take care of the lambs? Who's going to take care of the young souls? And in my heart came a burden to take my background in television and media and to create a missions tool that could go into any language in the world and that we would take the anointings and the, and the, and the, and the talents and the, and the teachings of the great teachers of the world and we're still finding them and we're still now exploring the nations to bring in the great teachings of the world to capture people's revelation understanding of the scriptures because we found out that nobody has all the answers. There's not one ministry, there's not one human being, there's not one person. No, no ministry has it all. There's some ministries that are very gifted in one area, in prayer or worship or healing or the, or the gifts of the Spirit. But each one carries a distinctive before God. And if you just want to feed in one place, you will become uh, imbalanced or unbalanced uh, in the things of God. And so we have to draw on the global church. We just took communion. The Bible says we have to recognize the body. Recognize the, the, the anointings and the giftings in the global church. And all we've done is to try and find those anointings and sometimes we've gone to the ends of the earth to, to discover them and bring them in and try to capture the understanding that those people have. Um, I, I have just a few items back there that, um, that I brought with me and I'm just going to mention a few of these just to give some illustrations here. Um, this is a message called Overcoming Grief. Um, it was um, you know, many people have lost loved ones, and one of the most difficult things is when you lose a child, or when you lose somebody that just makes no sense. And uh, sometimes, especially with, in, a, in a family that serves God, that loves God, and that still loses a, a, a child. And it's sometimes very, very difficult for people to, to keep their faith and to navigate through that. So. Um, we came across the story of Cheryl Salem, and Cheryl used to be Cheryl Pruitt. She was, in 1980, Miss America. I, in fact, I was at Regent University in CBN after my University of Michigan. I went to Regent and did a Master's in Television. And I remember interviewing her when she was Miss America. And she came through the CBN stand, it was on the 700 Club. And she married a man from, uh, who was an assistant to Oral Roberts, and she had three beautiful children, and their life was just, I mean, her story is just how she became Miss America. She, it's just miraculous, one miracle after another. When her third child was born, she already had two sons, and when that little child was five years old, they found out the child had a brain tumor. They prayed for 11 months, and uh, it was either 9 or 11 months. They, they cried out to God. They brought in every name because they were connected with our Roberts University. He's a healing evangelist. I mean, they, had, they, they did everything you know how. But the child, the Lord took the little girl, Gabriella, home. And after that, her heart was broken. Her faith was shattered. She literally said, Lord, I don't want to live anymore because she just had lost hope. And... They discovered then that she was very ill, that she actually had cancer, and they didn't even expect her to survive. And she said, Lord, that's good. Take me home. I don't want to live anymore. And, you know, they're trying to fight not just for her health, but now for her hope. And they decided at the very last moment, because she was so ill and they didn't think she would survive, that they tried to do an operation that may save her life, and they weren't even sure she'd make it through the operation. But she was ready to go home and be with Jesus, so she was on the gurney, and they were taking her into the operating room. She was on, on lying on her back, and she said goodbye to her husband. She said goodbye to her two children. She, and they said to her, if you see Gabrielle on the other side, tell her we love her. And she was being taken into the operating room. 
And in a moment, the Holy Spirit took her out of her body, put her up in the heavenlies, and she had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. And here she is in a moment of time, and now she's before her maker. And she's, you know, expecting now that she's, di she's died, but she actually hasn't. She's actually now just confronting Jesus face to face. The first thing Jesus said was, she was waiting for well done, all right? Because that's what you're supposed to hear when you get there. All the Lord said was, well. And then begins this interaction where she has this incredible interaction with the Lord. And she begins to ask, why did this happen to my daughter? Why did she get here? Why this? Why that? Why that? And it's a phenomenal. All the things she says, I mean, the, the answers God gives her are incredible. Well, at the very end, the Lord says to her, and I'll say one thing that, that God said. The Lord said, your daughter is not in your past. She's in your future. Stop looking back and stop looking forward. The Lord says, you're not going to die. He says, Lord, if you send me back, I ask you for three things. Says, he said, heal my body, heal my family, and restore my joy. The last thing God, Jesus said was done, and she was back with her body. At the end of it, she realized that God did say, well done, but said, well, and then a lot of things, and then done, and then she was back with her body. So she says to her husband, I'm not going to die, I'm going to live. And... She survived that, and she now has a worldwide ministry helping people to overcome grief. And uh, I'm looking for revelation. I'm looking for I'm looking for somebody who is not just telling you about something, but somebody who's lived through something, somebody who's come through a, a an encounter, an experience, an understanding that's below the surface. It's not just something that's peripheral and that's just you know um, you know trying to just make you feel good about something. You want somebody who's lived through something. Who can say, I've come through it, here's how to get through this valley. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Those are the kinds of messages that we, that we, we do. This is a, a, a very similar um, uh, type of depth of a, of a thing, but a very different type of, uh, of, of experience. A, a very strong church we partner with, in fact we produced a, a business training school with this church. His pastor's name is Diego Mesa, and, and he's an Hispanic pastor in... Ontario or Rancho Cucamonga in Southern California, about 20 minutes from where we live. 16,000 member church. There's an Hispanic pastor pastoring, pastoring a black church. It doesn't make any sense. It, it violates all the patterns of church growth or whatever. But this church is just flourishing and it's, and it's powerful. And this pastor has such an incredible ministry. He's a great man of God, one of the most generous human beings I've ever met in my life. So this pastor's now got this flourishing church, doing incredible things for God, just builds a $47 million campus. He's a man who came out of breaking his neck, came back to health and began running marathons. Ran the San Diego Marathon, ran the Los Angeles Marathon, I think the Boston one as well. And one day he just dropped, and he just has a pain inside and it just won't go away. And he finally goes to the doctor and says, you know, I don't know what this pain is about. And the doctor does some tests and finds out that he has stage four kidney cancer. Now what do you do? You, just, you have a $47 million campus, you're a pastor of a 16,000 member church, and now you've got stage four kidney cancer. One of the reasons I brought this, this teaching on healing I preached at this church actually just very right after we found out that news and I brought this teaching on healing. It's from the ISOM. We have a five part series from Baylor's Connolly on Jesus our healer today and I sowed this into that congregation because they needed to be built up in their faith on healing. It's normally $49 for this DVD and today we have it for 10 because my heart is that we need to understand the basis from scripture on healing. And his church rallied around him, and he decided, they, they gave him six months to a year to live. I mean, stage four kidney cancer is not, you know, a walk in the park. It's, not, it's, it's, it's basically deadly. It's a death sentence. But he decided to take a hold of God. He took like 167 scriptures and began to speak them over his life every day. He changed his eating habits. He changed his exercise, his rest pattern. He changed... Everything in his life, he just restructured his whole world. 
And he began to take a hold of God in a way that I, you know, I've known. They did take out a kidney. And then he was on a regimen of a chemotherapy where he was taking a $2,000 pill a day. The pill cost $2,000. It was a chemo regimen. And he fought. Two years later, he took all the rest of his pills and threw them into the Atlantic Ocean. Only two years later. And just, I'm not counseling anybody to do this, all right? I'm just telling you that this is what happened. He hasn't been back to a doctor in three years. It's now five years since it happened. He's now going on national television. He is uh, as healthy as a horse. He just built now a $5 million facility. In fact, he's in the process of building it to take care of handicapped children. And so God can, you don't have to take a dead sentence from a doctor. And I brought him in last year to speak to all of our leaders. And I asked him to, to bring, he, he gave a message called Lessons Learned on the Road to a Miracle. Because sometimes it's not somebody coming and waving a hand over you or just, you know, some great healing evangelist who comes with some great anointing. Sometimes God requires us to foundationally change what we speak, what we say, how we live, what we do. And that God brings healing through other means and other ways. So we need to learn from those things. Amen? Amen. I like to travel around the world and, and, and I like to, to find great teachings. Um, there's a few that I don't have back there, but I'm just going to give you one or two that I do. We found, and as we've been uh, working a lot with teenagers and with young people, that one of the big questions that young people have is, how do you reconcile Genesis chapter 1, how do you reconcile a six-day creation with you know, the fossil record. Where are the dinosaurs? Where's, you know, where's all the, the things that science tells us and the archaeology tells us? And how do you reconcile a six-day creation with all of that? Well, you see, I, I believe that somebody in the world carries the revelation. Somebody carries the understanding. We began to search around the world. We came across a number of books by a guy called Dr. Gerald Schroeder. Now, he's not Christian. He's Jewish. Not just Jewish, he lives in Jerusalem. And he holds a double PhD from MIT. Alright, that's a little, maybe in the area of engineering and technical, it's a little higher than University of Michigan. No, no. <laughs> a double PhD from MIT, he's watched six atomic bombs be exploded. He's one of Israel's leading scientists, and he's a Hebrew scholar teaching Hebrew at the Jerusalem University. And we got a hold of him in Jerusalem. I said, we will fly you business class to Los Angeles, and we want you to come and reconcile Genesis 1 and the scientific record. Because he believes they are both identical. And he brought them in, and he held up Genesis 1, he held up NASA's science thing of, of the creation of the universe. And he went through it step by step. <coughs> At the end of the thing, they match 100%. Every single thing in there. And he goes back into the Hebrew and he says, this is what it says. This is what the ancient commentaries say. This is what the Hebrew scholars say. And this is what it, what it actually says. It is six 24-hour periods. Remember, the sun and the moon only appear on day four. So this, the end of the evening and the morning are not being determined by the sun and the moon. They've been determined by six 24-hour periods. But it was also 14.5 billion years. And he goes into the Hebrew and shows the entire scope of it. Genesis is the Big Bang. And, and just, you know, to me, it brought revelation. It's helped young people to say, you know, here's something that scientifically makes sense and also biblically makes sense. We don't have to have a conflict. Talking about conflicts, my wife and I taught a message called Resolving Conflicts. He married 28 years to a fiery Italian. <laughs> and dynamite does come in small packages, I can attest to it. And, you know, it's, it's having holding together that has been very, it's, it's not easy at all. And my wife and I finally. You know, we were asked by our church in California, and our pastor said, you know, would well, you bring forth a, a Valentine's message? And, and we did one called Resolving Conflicts. And we identified we, what we call the Dirty Dozen, the 12 sources of conflict in a relationship. 
Once you can identify the source of the conflict, you can figure out how to fix it and how to overcome it. And so we did a message called Resolving Conflict. It's helped a lot of people in that area. Another area that the church seems to shy away from, doesn't do a whole lot with, is this area of sexuality. A lot of churches don't want to touch it or deal with it because it's a difficult thing to talk about, a difficult area to, to deal with. And so we looked around the world and said, God, who's got the anointing? Who's got the understanding? Because somebody's carrying it. Somebody's got a revelation from God. I came across a man by the name of Dr. Doug Weiss. He's out of Colorado. And he is uh, an, a, an anointed, spirit-filled ministry in this area, but also a, what do you call it, clinical uh, uh, guy who has an entire, you know, staff, and he has an, uh, people from all over the world, even in the secular realm, contact him from, uh, from overseas, from Switzerland and other people, come in to get counsel when they wanted somebody on Oprah Winfrey, they got him. When they wanted somebody on Good Morning America, they got him. He was recently on the Dr. Phil show. I don't know why he's on that show, but anyway, he he was you know dealing with this topic of sexuality and how to overcome these areas that are difficult. And then when he came in, he said, "What do you want me to teach on?" I said, "He's got about twelve books or fifteen books." And I said to him, "I want your story. How did you come to this ministry?" I said, "Number two, how I want you to teach a, a, a session on how do you overcome you know sexual abuse because so many people have experienced that in the church." And then I said, I want you to do one on sexual um, you know, addictions. So many people with the internet and things that are going on right now. People do not know how to break the chain and how do you overcome that? Number four, I said, I want you to do one on sexuality within marriage. And when he had done those four, normally we only do four recordings in a day. I, I came to him, I said, Dr. Doug, I said, we have just over an hour left. I said, can you do one more? Can you teach a lesson on how to help raise our children to be sexually pure? And he did a fifth session on that. And that, that series has just been just life-changing to so many churches and individuals. And, and what I want to talk today is just about changing our thinking about who we are. See, even in the area of sexuality, our society is throwing it us, you know, to our young people and saying, well, maybe you're this, or maybe you're that. Well, you feel, do you ever have feelings like this? Well, we try to now base our identity on how we feel, on what we think, on what society around us is telling us. And, you know, I want to just bring forth a message to you on identity theft. Because the enemy is stealing the identity of the church. And, it's, and, and, and he's destroying who we think we are because we're taking our cues as to who we are from, you know, our television shows. We're taking it from our magazines, from our internet, from all these other sources. And we as the church are losing our identity as to who we really are. We're buying into the world's narrative as to what we're supposed to be. And so, as I was, you know, preparing this message, I, I felt like the Lord gave me a, an insight into the Lion King. Now, many people say, you know, we're bringing the Lion King into a message. But, you know, the Lion King was written by some very godly people. There's a lot of Christianity that's in the Lion King story. It may be a children's cartoon, but, you know, there's a lot of depth in that story. And primarily, if you look at the main character of Simba as he's, you know, growing up and, and, and he is being groomed to be the next king and he's being groomed to be the king of the, of the beast and to take over the kingdom. And Mufasa, his father, is just, you know, raising him up and, and there's an enemy. His name is Scar, who's a picture of Satan. And that enemy is trying to figure out how to take that kingdom by deception. Take that kingdom and be able to control it and take authority over it by deceiving the mind of Simba. By stealing the identity of Simba. And he sets up that classic scene where, you know, he arranges a stampede and, and Mufasa is there with Simba and, and he, he, he sets it up in a way that Mufasa falls into the ravine and that stampede kills him. And then Scar is right there in the mind of Simba saying, it's your fault. 
You killed your father. You're the one who did it. You need to get away. You need to leave. You need to go another place because you're now full of guilt. You should be full of shame. And puts all of this on this young lion. And, and Simba takes off into a foreign land. And he abrogates his identity, abrogates his responsibility, and leaves the scene, leaving it to be ruled by darkness. And you know, that's a picture of our lives. Because if we don't take the identity that we're supposed to have in God, the enemy will take it by default. And if we don't take who we are supposed to be, and we don't have God's identity, the enemy will rule. And if you remember how the kingdom becomes a wasteland, and all of the enemy, all of the all of the hyenas are the ones in charge, and you know Scar is ruling it, and, and everything is dark, and everything is destroyed, and it's a horrific picture. And there in this foreign land, you know, Simba grows up, and he realizes that he needs to try and go back and do something. And he ends up coming back into the kingdom. And of course Scar confronts him and now Scar wants to take him out for good and destroy him and actually kill him. And he has no strength to fight. He's got no power. <coughs> he, you know, just, he's still, even though he's now a, a strong male lion, he still has no heart because his mind is stolen. His identity is stolen. He's full of shame. He's full of guilt. And if you have that mentality, you can't fight. You can't win. You can't overcome. And Scar gets him and gets him in a death grip. And he's on a big hell over a, or like a cliff face. And he's about to kill little Simba, who's now a male, full-blown lion. And just as he's got him in that death grip, he says, let me tell you the real truth of what happened. I killed your father. I am the one who arranged the stampede. I'm the one who did that. Not realizing that the moment that truth came into his mind, the moment that understanding came that he was not guilty, that he was not full of shame, right. that he was the king of the beast, and that this liar, this thief, has the one who has destroyed his father and is now trying to destroy him. Suddenly, that understanding fills him with courage, fills him with strength, and he turns the tables and he overcomes Scar and he destroys that, that wickedness, throws him down to the hyenas. And you see that amazing end scene when as he assumes the identity of king of the beasts, as he takes the authority that he was supposed to have from the beginning, suddenly blessing comes. Suddenly everything turns green. Suddenly the kingdom is full of joy. Suddenly all of the animals are dancing. And all of the, the end of that story is full of life and full of strength and full of hope. And you know what? There's a picture in our lives as Christians. Is the enemy steals who we are. He steals who we're supposed to be. He replaces it with his image. And so that's my, my first area is that, is that Satan steals our identity by getting us to believe a lie. He tries to get us to believe that, you know, we're guilty. That we, you know, are not what we're supposed to be. That he tries to get us to buy into something that he puts on us. And then he says, you're like this, you're like that. And he puts us... And he gets us to believe a lie about ourselves. One DVD I didn't mention is called Conquering the Sin Nature. And if I had one message in my whole life to leave behind, and this is what I told many of the teachers on the ISOM. They said, what do you want me to teach? And I said, if you're going to die next week, and you had one message to leave behind to the world, what would you teach? And I don't want a message you cooked up last week. I want your life message. I want your life anointing. And those are the messages that we went after. Well, this message is, is my life message. Because I wrestled with the thoughts of my mind. Trying to battle, to overcome, to think right thoughts before God. I fought for 13 years trying to conquer the sin nature. And it was, it was, not, it was not just a, an idle struggle. It was a life battle. 
trying to get victory over my thoughts. And I would be worshipping God, and an ungodly thought would come in my mind, and I would say, where did that come from? And I would try to fight it. I would bind the enemy. I would take authority. I'd throw scripture at it. I would, you know, try to pull down strongholds. I would do everything I knew how to do. But I found that the more I tried not to think about something, the more I thought about it. Then the enemy would sit on my shoulder and say, doesn't Jesus say, you know, that if you even think about it, that you've committed it? And now I had guilt. Now I had shame. Now my identity was being stolen by the enemy because I began to believe and buy into his lie. And so God opened up Romans 7 and 8. And God showed me that every human being has within them a <coughs> sin nature. We have an identity which came from Adam, which came down through the generations. It is a sin nature that all of us have, including Reinhard Bonker and the Pope. The sin nature is in all human beings. But when you accept Christ, a new creation is born. And a new person, that is the person who God relates to. That is the new creation that wants to serve God, that wants to love Him, that wants to do what's right. You still have the old identity, but in God's eyes, that old identity is dead. Yes. It has no power. But the enemy tries to convince you that that old identity is you. And what God showed me, as the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 7, he says, he says, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And the lie of the enemy is to convince you that the sin nature in you is you. But God's Word says the sin nature in you is not you in God's eyes. Right. It's what you got from Adam. And if the devil can convince you that the sin nature in you is you, he's got you in his cage. Did some study on the Houdini, the great escape artist. The great escape artist of Houdini, you know, he was able to get out of any handcuffs or, or any type of, you know, bondage, ropes, uh, chains, anything they put on him. They put him inside prison cells. They did everything they can to imprison this man, but he got out of everything. He was the greatest escape artist probably of the last hundred years. Harry Houdini. Amazing, amazing man. And he was able to get out of every single bondage except for one. In the southern Italy, they put him in a prison cell. And he worked for about three hours to try and get free from that prison cell. And he was unable to open the lock. He was unable to get free. And after three hours of trying, he finally gave up. He says, I've been able to break every lock. He was able to actually ingest keys, fit them out. He tried. He, I says, I, I've done everything I know how. He said, I cannot get out of this prison. Do you know why he couldn't get out of that prison? It was because it was already open. They never locked it. He was already free. He just didn't know he was free. The enemy can get you to think that you're in prison. It's as good as if he's got you in prison. You've got to change your thinking. And that's why getting a revelation of truth. Jesus said truth makes you free. People think the anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing can break the yoke, but only truth can make you free. When you have a revelation of truth, that sets you free. It took me 13 years to learn this message. Because when God broke that, let me tell you, it did something in my life. It wasn't just, oh, that's another nice scripture that I learned today. That was life and death to me. And that's what revelation is. Amen? Amen? If you can believe the truth about who you are, about your identity, who you really are in God, how God sees you, it'll change your life. Amen? Amen? So the first way the devil will try to get you to believe a lie about yourself. The second way that he steals your identity is by getting you to buy into the world's view of identity. Because if he can get you to buy into the world's narrative, into the world's way of thinking, see the world measures you by who you are, like, I mean, what kind of car you drive, how much money you have, it measures you by your education, it measures you by every single thing that, you know, uh, your looks, your, your weight, your size, your face, your this, your that. I mean, the world just throws the whole, you know, book at you. 
as to tell you, you're this, or you're that, or you're not. Or, and I mean, it's like got all of these standards, and, and we're trying to match up with them all the time to try and define ourselves by the world's standards. Yes. But that's not how God sees you. No. A friend of mine, his name is Pat Jarvis. His name is Pat Jarvis. And he came over to Germany, and I trained him as a television producer. Did an amazing show called The Fruit That Remains, and you know, became a very gifted, he was an incredible writer. He, he was unbelievable, so gifted. Went back to Hollywood, got a job working for Tribune Broadcasting, was writing movie scripts, was writing for uh, sitcoms and writing for different uh, television shows. And I mean, just successful and driving a beautiful car. And, I mean, really just rising in the Hollywood, you know, echelons of success. He was playing with a dog up in Hollywood Hills and got, got bitten by a tick that jumped off that dog and bit him. And he got something called Lyme disease. I'm sure you know it here in Michigan. And a very dangerous form of Lyme disease to the point where he nearly died a number of times. And he ended now into a 12 to 15 year struggle to try and overcome this disease. And I remember going to visit him. He was living out in Palm Springs and, and he told me, he said, you know, I used to have my whole life figured out. I mean, I had all of the success. I had everything that the world could offer. And he said, suddenly I was in a place where I, didn't, I couldn't even dress myself. I couldn't even go to the bathroom by myself. I couldn't even, he said, I, I had to rethink my whole identity. Who I am? Who am I? Am I defined by what I've achieved or what I've done or what I drive or who I am? He said, my whole world was had to be redefined. I had to refigure out who I am. Yes. Because all of that stuff can be taken away in a moment. Amen? Amen. King David, when he was a little boy, God said to Samuel, says, go out and find the next king. Saul has, has blown it. I want you to go to the house of Jesse, send him to Bethlehem. Tells him to call his, his sons, to, and God says, I've called a king among his sons. So Samuel goes out and he calls Jesse. Jesse gets seven of his sons, and they come to a big feast. And Samuel's got his, uh, his horn of oil, and he's about to anoint the next king. The first son stands up, and I mean, the guy is just good looking. He's strapping, he's strong. I mean, the muscles are bulging. He, just came out of making the movie 300. <laughs> I mean, those rippling abs, and he's got, I mean, just, I mean, he's just a picture, and, and Samuel's just about to run and just pour that oil on him. And God says, stop. And this is the words that God says to Samuel. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. God says, because I refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God looks inside. God's not interested in how you match up to society. He's not interested in all those things and those stuff that we judge everybody by. And so often this message is not just for how we look at ourselves, it's also how we look at other people. Now, I worked a lot with Reinhardt. He's very much a spiritual father. In fact, he's going to be coming to our regional conference in October of this year. Anybody who wants to come and, and have an, an incredible life-changing experience, we gather our leaders from around the world once every 18 months, and Reinhardt's going to be speaking to us. I learned so much. He was a spiritual father from this man. And I remember when God gave him this vision to take a little booklet called From Minus to Plus. And he was lying in bed one night, and, and Jesus came to him personally. I mean, uh, very few have those kind of experiences, but Reinhardt had them. And Jesus said to him, I want you to print this little booklet, and I want you to mail this booklet about the epic of the cross to every single home in the United Kingdom. Do you know how many homes there are in the United Kingdom? 26 million at that time. 26 million homes. Do you know what the postage is to pay for 26 million mailings? The project's budget was 6 million pounds, 10 million US dollars. <coughs> so Reinhardt said to the Lord, he said, God, he said, why me? 
<laughs> Why don't you find some of these other rich ministries and give this job to them? I want to go preach to the people in Africa. The Lord said, you're not my first choice, you're my third choice. <laughs> he said, Lord, okay, I give you two commitments, God. He says, number one, I will do an excellent job. Number two, he says, you won't have to look for number four. I will do it. There you go. So he took on this, this job, and then he now began to travel around England and the United Kingdom, Wales and Scotland and all up into Ireland, trying to convince the <coughs> British to give to this project. Now, first miracle is getting the book, but number two is more difficult. It's convincing the, the British, you know, to really sow that kind of money into this kind of project. I can say that because I have an accent you can hear. I'm not from there, but I'm from those roots. The Scottish are known for certain things. They say going Dutch. Well, Scottish are like a little bit lower below the Dutch, all right? In terms of frugality. And so Reinhardt's preaching is hard out of these churches and nobody's giving any money. And it's six weeks until the time of this, of this printing and this mailing. And I mean, they're just nowhere near. And Reinhardt's going and he preaches his heart out, shares the vision, the British, you know, throw their pennies in. And he finally goes to a little church in Wales, pastor by a guy called Ray Bevan. I know Ray because I used to film him when I was working for Reinhardt when he was doing ministry in the schools. <coughs> Ray's pastoring this little church there in, in, in Wales, and he gets up and he's a real joker. I mean, he used to like, you know, in schools go and do things behind the principal's back and do all, while he's supposed to be ministering to the kids, you know, and the kids are all laughing and then he'd get up and he would preach to them. So he's a real jokester. And Ray gets up and he says, oh, you know, you know, we need to just take this, we need to help Reinhardt. And, and he, he shares and then he says, he says, there's probably something here you could give a million pounds and it wouldn't even hurt you. And then he goes on, takes the offering and it's another bad offering. Well, after the service, the guy comes forward who's dressed like a tramp. I mean, he's like a homeless guy. Comes forward like, I mean, disheveled hair, terrible clothes, really, you know, not a good sight. And, and he says to Ray, he says, excuse me, sir, sir, he's never been in the church before. He says, um, he said, um, did anybody give the million pounds? And Ray looks at the guy and he says, it was a joke. It was a big joke. <laughs> and the man says, well, I'd like to speak to the pastor, to the, pre to the preacher, to Reinhardt. And he looks at the guy. He says, I'm sorry. He's very busy. He's having his tea. And as he's going back, the guy says, well, well where is he staying? And I guess in England they give out that information. He said, staying at that place down the road. 10 o'clock that night, telephone rings. And Reinhardt's about to go to sleep. And this guy's calling from the lobby down below in the in the same hotel. Brian says, hello. <laughs> he says, can I help you? The man says, Mr. Bonke, I'd like to ask you some questions. Brian says, who are you? The man says, I'm not telling you my name. He says, yeah, well, go ahead, ask your questions. For 20 minutes, he said, ask right on about all the, the logistics of this project. And then at the end of 20 minutes, he says, okay, I'm going to tell you my name now. And says, my name is such and such. Reinhardt says, I know you, sir. I know you. The man says, I've never met you before, Mr. Bonke. Reinhardt says, I just finished reading a book on the 100 wealthiest people in the United Kingdom. He said, sir, you are number 20. The man says, it touches me that you as a German want to help the British. There's a bit of history back there. All right. He says, I give you a million pounds. And into his account, five days later, one, one million pounds dropped. When the British heard that story, in the next six weeks, six million pounds dropped into his account. Sorry. And he printed a book and it reached the whole of the United Kingdom. When Reinhardt asked the man, he said, why are you dressed like a tramp? You could buy the whole store and make yourself look halfway decent. And the man said these words, listen carefully. He said, I always dress down so I can see what's in people's hearts. <laughs> You never know who you're speaking to. And the Bible says, God does not look like man sees. You look at the outward appearance, we create our identities based on all kinds of factors. But let me tell you, God looks at your heart. And your identity is based on your heart towards Him. Amen? Yes. So the devil tries to, number one, 
Make us believe a lie. Number two, help us to buy into the world's identity and what the world says we are. Well, you feel like this. Well, if you feel like this, then maybe that's what you are. That's not what you are. What you are is what God says you are. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. The last area is the enemy tries to help us to feel like we're nothing. He tries to work on the area of us being, you know what, God's really busy. He's got 7 billion people. With all these prayers coming up, he's just, you know, he's overwhelmed. You know, God can't handle this much stuff. You're just a nothing. You're just a, you know, you're just one little piece of the cog. You're just a tiny human being. You really don't have much significance in the big picture. I don't even want to know why you're trying. He tries to get us to feel like we're insignificant. We're not even valuable. We're not worth anything. And we're not, you know, we're not anything in this world. You know, probably some of the greatest ways that God can break that is for God to show you that you personally are known by God. That He knows everything about you. That every part of your life there's nothing that is not known by God. So many times in the scripture, the Bible talks about God visiting people. And God says to Samuel when he was a little kid, he says, Samuel, Samuel, calls him by name. God says to Saul when he is on the way to Damascus and Jesus appears and says, Saul, Saul, he says, I know who you are. Zacchaeus is coming through Jericho. I mean, Jesus is coming through Jericho and Zacchaeus is in Jericho and he's so small that he gets up in a tree and he wants to see Jesus come by. <coughs> Jesus stops under the tree and says, Zacchaeus, today I'm coming to your house. See, in Zacchaeus' mind it's like, who am I? What is, what is Jesus even recognizing? He's a tax collector, he's a thief, and he's a, you know, a nothing in the, in the big scheme of things. But Jesus stops there and says, you, Zacchaeus. I remember when Reinhardt was, was in Australia. He was praying one day in the, in, in, before a big meeting. There was maybe 10,000 people that night he was going to be preaching to. And as he was praying, God said to him, <coughs> Reinhardt, tonight in the meeting, I want you to call out a young man by the name of John. And now began a little bit of an argument between Reinhardt and the Lord. And Reinhardt said, Lord, you realize we're in Australia? The Lord says, yes, I know that. He said, Lord, about every third person here is called John. It's like being in Korea saying, there's a Kim here. You know, I mean, there was a Park or a Lee. I mean, almost you guaranteed to have, that's, a, that's like people are going to say, yeah, that's really a word from the Lord. <laughs> and God's like, but I can't change his name. His name is John. And he didn't realize that there was a mother that morning who was praying who had a 16 year old son by the name of John and that son had turned us away from God because he didn't believe that God cared. And as she was praying, the Lord spoke to that mother and said, ask your son John to come tonight. God is going to call him out by name. Ooh, glory. Glory. And so that night, right on being very foolish, said, there's a young man here by the name of John. And that, that son turned to his mother and said, If God calls me out by name tonight, my life will belong to Him. Yes. And that young man jumped out of the seats where he was and he ran to the front weeping and crying and gave his heart to Jesus. God knows your name. Yes. My daughter Christina was attacked in Nigeria. We were missionaries there. Attacked by demonic powers. They came and she saw them in a room. And she heard a voice of an angel over her bed. And when she, when we were growing up, we called her Steggy because she liked dinosaurs and land before time. We used to call her Steggy. Even to this day, we call her Steggy. And as she's there lying in this demonic power, she's in her room, and she can see that thing. She hears the voice of an angel speaking to the demonic entity. And the, the angel says, don't you touch my Steggy. That's right. That's, right. That's what the angels spoke. Amen? Lord. You see, God's got angels over you. Yeah. You're special to heaven. Right. You're precious to Him. You're known by heaven. Every single thing about you is known. And so you've got to understand the enemy tries to steal. 
how precious and how valuable that you are to God. Are you with me, church? Yes. Who are you? Number one, you're a son or a daughter of the Most High God. You are a child of God. You're a son or daughter of God. The Bible says, uh, you know, this is my daughter, all right? I give my life for her because I love her because she's, you know, she's my offspring. She is somebody who's so precious. You're going to realize you are adopted into the family of God. You are a son or daughter of the Most High God. You belong to Him. He'll, he'll, he'll give anything for you. You've got to understand how valuable and precious you are and your identity is a child of God. That's who you are. You have to embrace that identity. You have to realize what does it mean. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. We are called sons and daughters of God. It's not, it's not something idle to be a child of the Most High. Angels are the child of the Most High. We are. We are sons and daughters of Him. Are you with me, church? That's who you are. Number two, you're created in God's image. The Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Genesis 1.27, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. Whether you're male or female, you are created in the image of the Most High God. You bear the image of God on this planet. You aren't just sort of some arbitrary creation. You are the imprint of heaven, the imprint of the Father, the imprint of the Most High God. You carry His image. You represent Him on this earth. Amen? That's who you are. People don't know who they are. No, I'm telling you who you are. Yes. You're a child of God and you're created in His image. Yes. Glory. And that we're going to reflect His glory. Number three, it says here well, in, in Psalm 139, verse 13, another scripture concerning that. The, the David, King David writes, he says, You form my inward parts. You, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I did a whole study on on human DNA, on the, on the intricate structure that every one of us here was, was originally one cell. And now you're 100 trillion cells in your body. And if you took the DNA in each cell on your body and put it end on end, it would reach from here to the sun and back 486 times. The DNA in your body. Do you realize that there are 55,000 enzymes in your body? And if you miss one enzyme, just one out of 55,000, you're dead. Every one of them is vital. Your body is so incredible, the way the DNA works, the way the encoding of your entire life, your eyes, your ears, it's all encoded into one speck smaller than a pinprick. The entire blueprint of your entire life how God formed you and how He created and how He made you. When you study DNA, you realize you are fearfully and wonderfully yes. made. There's no one of you that's not valuable and incredibly intricately made by God. Yes. You're no accident. God formed you. And David says, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Number three, your eternity cost God heaven's highest price. The blood and the death of His Son. You have to understand your salvation cost God the highest price that heaven can pay. It wasn't just like, oh, some angel, go down there and take care of these humans. They're really messed up. I mean, you were so valuable to God that God was willing to literally bankrupt heaven to give the most valuable thing that he possibly could to pay to redeem you and bring you back. God was willing to give the highest price that heaven could give. He was willing to give His only Son and was willing to let Him die and take the sin of the world and He was willing to go through the suffering of all of that to redeem you back. He was willing to pay the highest price of heaven. That's how valuable you are to Him. To purchase you. And when we don't consider ourselves worthwhile and we don't consider ourselves you know, to be anything special, we better think again. Because that's not how God sees us. God sees us as infinitely valuable. And when you start to see your identity 
as being I was purchased by heaven. God paid the highest price because I must have value if he was willing to do that. Amen? Amen. We need to see ourselves the way God sees us. The Bible says, number four, that you are royalty in God's eyes. The Bible says we are a generation of kings and priests. Revelation 1.5, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. You are a king and a priest. Christina was at this gathering and there, were, there was the king of Togo there. There was head of the Cherokee nation. There was, there was ambassadors. There was leaders. There was world leaders in this group that she was a part of two nights ago. And God's made us ambassadors of Christ. He's made us kings and priests. We are rulers in this world. We're much greater than Simba was he was ruling his kingdom. We are created to rule for eternity. Yes. And God has made us kings and priests. Who are we? What's our identity? It's what God says we are. It's not what the world says. It's not what your friends say. It's not what your family says. It's not what anybody else says. It's what God says you are. Amen? Amen. Your past has been wiped clean. You have to understand your identity is that you are forgiven. You're washed. In God's eyes, He looks at you. And you're a new creation. He doesn't see the old man. He sees a new person. He sees you in Christ. And he sees you as a new creation that's washed, washed clean. No matter how many things you've done in the past, that's not who you are. 2 Corinthians 5.17 That anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Bible says that in our thinking, we have to start reckoning ourselves dead to sin. It's a thinking process. You have to start seeing yourself in a different way. You have to start, well, you say, well, that's not what so-and-so told me. That's not what my parents told me. That's not what my, you know, my brother told me or my spouse told me. You know, they all told me that I was no good, that I wasn't going to make anything or do anything. God says, I'm telling you who you are. You are a new creation. You are a person who is new in me. And everything else has been washed away. It's gone. And finally, all the promises that God made to Jesus have been made to you. 2 Corinthians 1, 2, 20. All the promises of God in Him are yes and in Him. Amen. Yes. To the glory of God through us. <coughs> everything that God promised us. Everything that God promised Jesus, which is the inheritance of this earth. Which is an eternal life. Which is an eternity with Him. Which is to rule and reign over the planet. All of those things are made to us. In Christ, we have the same promises. We will rule and reign with Him. Yeah. We are in Him. We are in everything that has been given to Him has been given to us. Yeah. We are one in Christ. He is our identity. Yes. Jesus, we grow up to become like Him. Yes. That's who we are. Yes. We're supposed to be Christ-like. Mm. But you have to start thinking of yourself as to who you are. You have to change your thinking of your identity to match what God says that you want. Yeah. Yes. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer. I'd like to see everybody's eyes closed for a moment. A number of people here that needed to hear this today. God brought you here. He loves you. He wants you to know that you're valuable. That you are greatly beloved. That you are greatly loved by heaven. That God was willing to pay the highest price of heaven to redeem you. And that God loves you. He brought you here to let you know you're not what other people say you are. No matter what you feel like or what you think <coughs> of, you need to understand that when God tells you you are, that's who you are. And that's who you can become. If you'll begin to see yourself the way God defines you, the way God sees you. There's a number of people here that maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never opened your heart to Him, and maybe you've never given your life and your future into His hands, and maybe you've never embraced what He did for you on the cross. Because the Bible says He died for your sins. He gave His life so that you could have it. But you have to receive it. You have to accept what He did. You've got to receive His love. And you've got to accept Him as your Lord and your Savior. You have to give your future to His hands. You have to ask Him to define the way that you will go. You have to ask Him to be the Lord and Savior of your life. 
And if that's you today, then you need to make that step. If you need to give your heart to Jesus Christ. I would like to have the privilege of praying for you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I would want to pray with you. This is between you and God, and like that angel was there when my daughter was there in Nigeria. There are angels in this room here, and Jesus himself yes. is here. Thank you, Lord. And he's asking, who is here that wants to make Jesus Lord? Who is here that wants to give their heart and their life to him and their future to his hands? Who wants to come into his kingdom and make Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior? Who wants to embrace a faith in what he did on the cross for you? Who wants to have their sins washed away and their past forgiven and come into his kingdom? And who wants me to pray to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? Today, if that's you, I'm just going to ask you while our eyes are closed just to raise up your hand and put it right back down again. I'm just going to acknowledge you. If you need that prayer, I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand there. I see your hand there. Anybody else see your hand there? I see your hand there. I see your hand there. Many hand two over here. Anybody else that needs to join in that prayer? Anybody else? This is between you and God. I'm not going to embarrass you. As I said before, there's at least 10 or 15 that have raised their hand. Anybody else that wants to join? Anybody else? That they, they need to make this right between you and God today. Anybody else? I see your hand. Anybody else? God sees your hand. The angels see you. They, they know every single hand. Anybody else needs to do that? Another hand here. Anybody else needs to do that? I, I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. Anybody else? We're going to pray in a moment. Don't miss out. This is between you and the Lord. Heaven takes rain. Anybody else? Last chance. If you now once served God, but you're away from Him, you need to come back to Him. Like you also to raise your hand if you need to do that. I see your hand. Anybody else needs to do that? I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand. I see anybody else needs to do that. This is between you and God again. Heaven alone will take record of this. Anybody else needs to do that? I see your hand back at that. Anybody else needs to do that? I see your hand. Anyone else? We're all going to pray in a moment. Your last chance. All together. Anybody else needs to do that? There must be 20 hands that have gone up between these two areas. I want us all to pray this prayer. If you didn't have enough courage to raise your hand, but you need to pray this prayer, I want you to pray from your heart. Pray it to the Lord. Let's all pray this together. Say, Dear Jesus. I thank you that you love me. I believe that you are the Son of God. You left heaven, the royalty of heaven, born in a manger. You came as a child to this earth. You grew up. You went to a cross. I believe you died a horrible death, a painful death, for my sins and for my salvation. You paid heaven's highest price to redeem me from my sin. I believe you rose from the dead. But you're alive right now. You're here in this place. I ask you to forgive my past. Wash my sin with your precious blood. I ask you, Jesus, come into my life. Define my future. Be the Lord, the Savior of my life. <clears throat> Let me be changed on the inside. Let me be born again by your Holy Spirit. Come into my life right now. I give my future into your hands. I receive you now. And I thank you that you love me, that you receive me, that I am a child of God. I'm born again, and I'm headed for heaven. I'm denying hell. I give my future to you. In Jesus' name, I receive you now. your eyes closed for a moment. Lord, I just pray for every person. I ask you to touch their hearts. I let them feel the power of your spirit. I ask you to wash them clean 
I ask that your anointing and the blood of Jesus would wash away their past. And I ask that your presence, your peace, your love would fill them on the inside. I ask you now to let them know that they are children of the Most High God. And that you receive them now into your family. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. An incredible message this morning, finding your identity in Christ. I've seen my journey in walk with Christ. I've had the privilege of watching people find their identity in Christ and who they are and what God says about them. And to watch somebody to have that revelation and watch them blossom and grow a completely different person. And, um, I hope this morning that some of you that maybe are here this morning, that maybe you are broken, maybe you don't know who you are in Christ. Maybe you're just going through life and you, you're just not confident. You just um, you don't understand what God says about you. But you are a child of God. And this morning, if you can grab hold of what the Word says and who you are, you will be set free and you will be a new person. Amen. Let's just uh, thank Dr. Uh, Gil Phelan again this morning for being here. To, uh, do one more song here and if you guys have to go feel free to leave um, if you want to join us and continue to worship in his presence um, we're just going to do one more short song I